Welcome to the Faith Focused Free Thinking Podcast, a ministry of Ozaki Congregational Church in Grafton, Wisconsin. This is our fourth episode, and we're glad you're with us. Hello, I'm Jeff Larson. Thanks so much for joining us here at the Faith Focused Free Thinking Podcast. I apologize that it's taken me an extra week and a half to get this episode out. I'll spare you all my bad excuses. Uh, But today I want to answer a couple questions that I've heard over the past number of years as I've been on this journey that I've been on. We say that faith is a journey and I think that's true for all of us. All of us grow and change and morph in our perspectives and our understanding of life and God and, and, and the world. And certainly that's been true for me. I feel like what I'm doing in these first number of episodes is just sort of wrestling through my own my own journey and my own thoughts, and I hope that's uh, okay, and I hope that's uh, that's helpful for you. But as I've been on this journey toward embracing the idea that God is going to redeem everybody, that God is going to save everybody, that everybody goes to heaven eventually, and moving away from the idea that God is going to torment anybody for all eternity in a, in a place metaphorically similar to a lake of fire called hell. Uh, as I've been on this journey, uh, I have heard a number of different questions from people within the, the church, and two questions that I've heard more than any others that have been the most frequently asked. And I want to talk about those those two questions today. But at first, it's, it's really been interesting on this journey uh, to sort of experience uh, the different Christian traditions, a couple different Christian traditions. I grew up in a, in a sort of conservative evangelical tra- tradition, and uh, I always say that I experienced the very best of that tradition, uh, from the, the love of my parents to the churches I attended to the people that I knew and the people that were significant in my life. I just experienced the very best of, of that tradition. And even though my theology and perspective on life has taken me in some new directions, I'm so grateful for the the upbringing that I had and the tradition that I was a part of. But here at Ozaki Congregational Church, we are part of mainline Protestantism. And mainline Protestantism in America would be distinct from evangelicalism, which is the tradition I grew up in, and also distinct from what might be called Pentecostalism, and maybe there's a few other isms uh, within America as well, sort of branches of Christianity. But I think it would be accurate to say that you could divide Christianity into three main branches, Roman Catholicism, the Eastern Orthodox Church, and Protestantism. Of course, the Roman Catholicism or Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, <clears throat> they were created or sort of cemented uh, as separate branches of Christianity in something known as the Great Schism, which took place in 1054 AD, where the Pope of Rome and the, Const- or the Patriarch of Constantinople excommunicated one another, and, and these two uh, uh, branches of Christianity were, were formed. And then, of course, in the 1500s, uh, Martin Luther and John Calvin and the Protestant Reformation, which came out of Roman Catholicism as well, happened, and Protestantism was was born and underneath Protestantism you get Lutheranism and uh, Lutherans and Baptists and Anglicans and Presbyterians and all of that and then under this umbrella of Protestantism within America you get again mainline Protestantism evangelicalism Pentecostalism and and maybe a few other branches as well and it's been interesting for me growing up in evangelicalism and now being a part of mainline Protestantism and sort of experiencing the difference, differences between those two and the different emphases. And uh, that's been really interesting. One of the things that, that's been kind of an um, a interesting example uh, of that for me has been the response to, or was the response to Rob Bell's book, Love Wins. Now, if you're if you grew up in an evangelical tradition, I'm sure you're familiar with that book. Rob Bell was the founding pastor of Mars Hill Church in Michigan, part of the evangelical tradition, sort of an up and coming, uh, well known young uh, pastor, uh, very influential. And in 2011, he wrote this book called Love Wins, which many saw as sort of a a defense of 
uh, or at least the suggestion of the idea of universalism or ultimate redemption or that God is going to redeem everybody. And uh, I, I think Rob Bell sort of stopped short of endorsing that in, in the book Love Wins, but many people saw it as that within evangelicalism. And it, the the reaction to it within evangelicalism was aggressive, and it just created a, a real strong reaction, a firestorm of sorts against uh, it. And uh, I was... I was part of that, part of evangelicalism when that happened, and I remember hearing different comments about it. But the people within mainline Protestantism, I mean, sort of the, the way it was caricatured was there was this firestorm within evangelicalism about Rob Bell's love wins, and mainline Protestantism barely yawned, barely batted an eyelid, like this wasn't even a thing. And of course, the idea of universalism or ultimate redemption this has long been a part of, of Christian history and the idea of it and uh, has been accepted in, in many uh, circles or certainly some circles. Um, but it was just interesting, the, the different reaction to, to those uh, from both of those, those traditions. And for some of you, you, you grew up in a sort of a more conservative tradition and, and maybe you're your reaction would that be that way? And some of you grew up in mainline Protestantism, and it's just not that that big a deal. But these two questions that I uh, want to talk about today really came from people within the evangelical church. And uh, so I, I hope addressing them uh, is helpful to you, wherever you are in, in, uh, in the different Christian traditions. But again, as I sort of began to embrace this idea of ultimate redemption, uh, there were two questions that were asked most frequently. The first was this. Well, if God is going to save everybody, if God is going to redeem everybody, if God's not going to send anybody to eternal damnation, well then, why don't I just go do, do whatever I want? I mean, in a sense, why would I follow Jesus? Why am I embracing faith? Why am I doing all these things? And it's an interesting question. And I find it interesting that it's coming from with people within the church. Because I think essentially what the question is saying is, the only reason I'm following Jesus, the only reason I'm pursuing faith, is because God is threatening to torment me for all eternity if I don't. I mean, I don't really believe that God's way is best. I don't really find hope and joy and peace in following the self-sacrificial way of Jesus. And if God wasn't threatening to punish me for all eternity, well, then I'd prove to him and I'd prove to myself that life is found in the pursuit of my own selfish self-interest. And I, 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 you can see why that's interesting. And I don't think people are really serious. I don't think they, they really uh, actually just go do whatever they want if God's going to save everybody. I, I mean, I think all of us have, have gone down the road of sin and selfishness. All of us have pursued our own selfish self-interest, and it just doesn't lead you where it th- you think it leads you. It doesn't lead to hope and joy and peace. And following the way of Jesus, in pursuing faith, I think this gives meaning in life. We find joy and hope and peace there. Embracing the unconditional love of God for us, I think, makes a difference. And I I don't think we need the threat of eternal damnation in order to encourage people to, to follow Jesus or to encourage people to pursue faith or to embrace the the love of God for us. And so uh, I, I'm not, I'm, if, if believing that God is going to redeem everybody is going to cause some people to just pursue their own self or self-interest, I think that's okay. I don't think they're going to find down that road what they think they're going to find and, and are going to turn around eventually to embrace uh, the unconditional love of God shown to them in the person of Christ. So anyways, that was interesting. That was the first question. The second question, which I have heard recently, I, uh, from, from somebody recently, was this. What if you're wrong? What if you're wrong? And uh, again, the question is meaning, hey, here you are preaching and teaching that God is going to redeem everybody, but what if he's not? Then are you not failing to warn people? Or, I mean, here you're, you're telling people that God's love is for them, and maybe it's not, and, you know... And I have answered this question in a number of different ways over the years. 
I thought of a new answer to it recently. Uh, but the, the, the ways I would respond to it are, one, I'd say, well, if our goal, if your goal is to get people to follow Jesus, people need to believe in Jesus or do what God wants them to do or whatever, um, if that's the goal, I, I think we're going to do that better by focusing on the unconditional and unlimited love and grace of mercy of God. I think more people are going to, to come to faith in Jesus rather than less. I don't think the threat of eternal damnation is very good motivation. And so if I'm wrong, I still think this is the best way to encourage people to, to embrace the message of the gospel or to follow Jesus. Second, uh, my response to that question would be, somebody would say, what if you're wrong? And I would say, well, what if you're right? I mean, what if this is who God is? What if at the end of the day, God is going to condemn to eternal damnation or be unable to save or is going to pass over certain people? What if God maybe even is going to let the majority of humanity suffer for all eternity in a place metaphorically similar to a lake of fire? I mean, what if this is who God is? Then I think none of us are safe then I think all of us are in really deep trouble. Because I, I find, I, I, I can't find a reason that that's not me. I mean, why am I not the one going to eternal damnation? Why, why am I not the one who is self-deceived into thinking that I'm saved or thinking that I'm right in my standing before God and maybe I'm not actually? Why am I not uh, among those in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, which says, Many will say to me on that day, Hey, did we not in your name do many miracles and drive out many demons? And, and the king will say to them, I tell you the truth, I never knew you. Depart from me. I mean, why is that not me? Why am I so assured that, that I'm saved, that I'm right in my standing before God and other people are not? And I just think, if I can't trust God to save everybody, then I can't trust God to save me. And if I'm wrong and you're right, I think we're all in deep trouble. And I just think, ah, we're not going to live like that. We're not going to live like that. I just can't believe that that's who God is. The third way I would, I would answer that question is, people say, what if you're wrong? And I'd say, I, it seems like what the, the question is wanting me to do is to try to live uh, with the possibility of the worst case scenario in mind to try to account for the possibility of the worst case scenario. That I ought to live as though, in case, God is a sadistic monster who's going to torment us for all eternity and do whatever I can to try and appease him. I mean, just in case, uh, this, is, uh, this is true. And I just think, uh, again, we're not going to live like that. I'm not going to live like that. I'm not going to live in fear for myself or for my kids or for the world. And if that's who God is, well, then that's who God is. And neither you nor I nor anybody has anything to say about it. But again, I just cannot believe who that's who God is. And I am not going to live in fear. And I don't think you ought to either. But the last way I've thought of, of answering that question, which is, uh, I just thought of this uh, this summer. It's sort of related to the to the last way I've answered it. But if somebody's saying to me, "Hey, what if you're wrong?" I want to say to them, "Hey, I want to ask you the same question." Like if I said, and and I want to try and answer it for you. Like if I said to you, "What if you're wrong?" And somebody who has an even more conservative perspective, who somebody who believes that even fewer people are going to be saved. What if they're right? What if they're right and you're wrong? And like, if we can take it to its extreme and use the most fringe group as an example, and what if Westboro Baptist Church is right? If you're familiar with Westboro Baptist Church, they're the group out of Kansas. And, and I, I think it would be accurate to say that they believe that it's only the people, the 20, 30, 40 people within their group that are right and are saved and are going to heaven and everybody else is going to hell. Everybody else is, is wrong. What if Westboro Baptist Church is right and you're wrong? And I think what the person would say 
and and if, if trying to answer the question for them, I, I, I would say, I think what you're going to say first is you're going to try and create a case why Westboro Baptist Church is wrong, and you're right. Why Westboro Baptist Church, they're not representing the message of the gospel accurately, and they're twisting scripture and, and all of that, and and here's why you're right or why you're representing the, the gospel accurately. And I would say, you know, okay, I know, we get that. I know that you, th- you think you're right and Westboro Baptist Church is wrong, but that's not the question. The question is, what if you're wrong? What if Westboro Baptist Church is right? And I think the person, I mean, what you're going to get around to saying is, well, if Westboro Baptist Church is right and I'm wrong, well, I mean, that's the way it is, but... I'm not going to live like that. I'm not going to live like Westboro Baptist Church, sort of arrogantly certain in my perspective, wagging a finger in the face of anybody else who doesn't agree with me, and and sort of living in either fear or arrogant certainty. And you're just going to say, I'm not going to live like that. And I guess for me, that's sort of my response to, the, what if you're wrong? Well... If I'm wrong, that's that's the way it is. But I'm I'm not going to live in fear, and I'm I'm not going to live in an arrogant certainty. I I'm going to attempt to live with hope, and joy, and peace, and a love for myself and a love for others. And I'm going to trust that God is good. I'm going to trust that God is good enough and wise enough and loving enough and justice just enough to both deal with the evil in the world, to bring about justice and also to redeem us all. And for me, that gives me hope. And it gives me a love for myself and a love for others. It, it motivates me to be a conduit of the love of God to those around me. And so, uh, I, I, yeah, that's all I want for me and that's all I want for anybody, is for people to live with hope and to live with joy and peace. So, I guess that's it for today. That's episode four. I hope it's uh, somewhat helpful for you. Uh, again, I just think wrestling through these things and thinking about these things is, is really helpful and is really important. And as we morph and change on this journey of faith, what I hope, yeah, for all of us is that we live with less fear, less worry, less pressure on our shoulders, more peace, more hope, more joy. And I find it in embracing the unconditional love of God that I see represented to me in the person and story of Jesus. So, shoot me a note. Again, you can find us at occhurch.org. My email is just jeff at occhurch.org. I'd love to hear what you think. I hope you have a wonderful Christmas, a wonderful New Year's, and we will see you in 2024. Thanks so much for joining us. 